Test, test, test. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm sure you've heard these announcements a zillion times already, but um, let's see. Okay. Voight Conf testing. There's extended hours today. I believe that they're testing right now. Uh, make sure to stay hydrated. Drink lots of water. Uh, there are more New Relic bottles over at Reg if you want any of them. I don't know if there's any still at the back of the stage, but uh, make sure to get some of those. Um, the restaurant is not open right now, but will be open um, for dinner tonight. Uh, make sure to check that out before 8 p.m. If you have questions for uh, the speaker, you can hop on our Discord, and um, they, if, they're, if they join, or we'll be able to answer your questions there. Um, please make sure to throw away trash in the trash dumpsters and recycling in the recycling dumpsters. I know it's the flip-flopped colors from what we're used to in Seattle or other areas, so just uh, double check before you throw things away. Uh, if you're interested in making uh, some light-up wings to wear for the festivities tonight, there is a uh, workshop at 6 p.m. on the hardware hacking stage where you can uh, make some cool wings with EL wire. And um, I think I'm going to make some wings for myself. That sounds awesome. <clears throat> uh, the Ada's Cafe is closing, I think, in the next 30 minutes. So if you want a nice iced latte like the one that I have over there, um, it's your last chance for the day. Uh, shirts are for sale. Mugs are for sale. I think both are $20 over at Reg. Um, and they're going quickly. So if you uh, want an extra shirt, make sure to stop by there. They close at 6.30 PM, and they're going to be closing for good. Uh, and then after that, Lost and Found will be moving to security, which is the retreat uh, retreat house down over here. Um, there is a network hacking workshop that just got added to the schedule that's happening at 3 p.m. in about 30 minutes. Uh, ham radio exam. Uh, I guess there were a lot of people that missed out last night, so we were doing another one tonight at 8 p.m. in the night market. Uh, we have shuttle hours tomorrow from 8.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. And if you need other uh, shuttle times, we'll have a way where you can call it in. And um, I guess uh, that is all I got here. So uh, without further ado, we have uh, Pranav talking about visual programming. Please give him a warm welcome. Hey, y'all. Um, OK, awesome. Uh, hey, y'all. So uh, I'm Pranav, and I'm going to be talking about visual programming. So. Um, Let's get start started. So uh, first things first, for a bit about me, I'm from Redmond, Washington, and in SF for the summer. Um, I work for a housing startup called Jupe, focusing on glamping. And uh, I'm going to be talking a bit about a project I worked on. I also, huge thanks to Code Day um, for, uh, yeah, for uh, they're the reason I'm here. And also, huge thanks to Hack Club, both of those. I just wanted to say huge thank you. Um, they're, they're the reason why I'm into programming. And um, yeah, both of them are amazing. And um, yeah, so let's get started. So I wanted to start off by talking about Scratch. So it's basically a project by MIT where they basically developed a block programming language for developing games. And uh, to date, since the project started, they've had 43 million users and um, from 150 countries. And the typical way that programming is introduced um, in the classroom is typically through Scratch. And um, I got started with programming through Scratch, and I think that many others, especially um, people um, who were in school after the project was introduced, um, probably also got introduced the exact same way. And Scratch was a really magical experience for me because I was able to, with like zero knowledge before, start making games, share them with friends. And I remember the atmosphere of the classroom from when we got started. And it was just electric because everyone was just building amazing games and playing them on different computers. And Scratch was um, really awesome. And I think that a couple of reasons why Scratch was so successful is because rather than uh, the typical introduction of programming, which is often just um, like getting started with text-based programming languages from the start, like like Java, for example, like Scratch really put like the game mechanics over like actually having to learn the syntax of Java or something like that. Because you could, um, with zero technical experience, get started almost immediately. And like from the time when someone um, got started with uh, programming in Scratch, the time to which they had a functioning game is like very close to zero. Like once 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 you get started by making a game in Scratch, usually like you could have like a fairly basic game done in just minutes. And whereas like in typical text-based programming, that's far higher because you have to like get do get your local environment set up and so many other um, steps that make the process so much more complicated. Scra like, um, and Scratch abstracting that away was another reason why I think it was successful. And then the final thing which I thought was just awesome about Scratch is that you could share and publish games in just one click. 
And um, Scratch is also just a community of makers. Like if you go to their website, like scratch.com, like scratch.mit.edu slash explore, you can see so many like amazing projects created by um, people all across the world from different countries. And um, I think that making the sharing and publishing experience super easy was one of the other main reasons Scratch was successful. And I think that we can take a lot of lessons from Scratch and apply that to many different fields, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. So like typically whenever we think about like the layers of abstraction all the way from like binary all the way up to like no code tools that are typically there, we usually go from binary to assembly to like lower than higher level programming language. And then uh, with like no code, which abstracts that all the way to the top. Like the main advantage of lower level programming language is that you have more control, but they're less approachable. Like it's a lot easier for someone to get started with Python, which abstracts away stuff like managing your own memory versus starting off with um, C. But then um, I think that um, for many people, especially people who aren't programmers and don't have an intention of um, learning like the whole process of programming, I think that they often um, go to the very top, which is usually like the no code, like the web flows of the world and other companies like that. But I think that what made Scratch successful is that it found an intermediate stage between like higher level programming languages and no code, where people could still really program and have that control that they usually had with um, uh, with programming while still being just as approachable as many other no-code tools. And I think that we can take this lesson of visual programming and apply it to many other domains. And I'll talk about uh, a couple projects which that was really helpful. Because I think that like it's really important that we can enable everyone to be able to make things. Like I think that projects like um, uh, Libra Pay are really helpful because they allow creators who might not have enough programming knowledge to set up a basic web page to be able to accept donations and fund their work. Like, so even if a creator is non-technical completely, projects like that and Patreon allow them to um, set up donations. Like Shopify allows so many people to set up storefronts just because, like, and especially if they don't want to hire a web developer to make their own storefront for them. And then other no-code platforms, many of which are open source, also allow others to be able to build websites. And I think that these are really powerful and that we should should really focus on trying to advance citizen development and enable everyone to be able to make things regardless of whether they have a technical background. And so um, I'm going to be talking a bit about my journey into machine learning and how uh, I think visual programming is really helpful there. So when I first was getting started with machine learning, which I think was like one to two years ago, my experience before that was primarily in web development and like some of the math required. But the main challenge when I was trying to get started was mostly just local environment setup. Like I was just thinking about how do I get Anaconda to work? What's this random error with installing dependencies? And this basically meant that before I had something built, it usually took 15 to 20 hours, most of which weren't actually doing any of the programming or like thinking of any of the logic behind my program, but almost all of them have to do with just local environment setup. And I think that that's something that really should be abstracted away. And um, having like that scratch like element, which um, uh, means that the time to get started is zero would be really helpful for this. And then finally, on top of that, shareability was something else that just wasn't there because like learning how to use Flask then setting up a website and all of that was a really annoying process. And it basically meant that it took 10 hours after I had something built to be able to share it with anyone, especially with deployment. And I think that these things that were there with Scratch really weren't there here. And that leads me to one project I worked on with Benjamin Smith, who's right here. Um, and we were basically trying to build a visual programming language like Scratch for machine learning. And it's called um, Cobra. You can find it at um, cobra.dev spelled um, uh, with a K. And the core principles behind Cobra is that like most of these entry barriers that typically discourage beginners, um, we wanted to abstract those away, like local environment setup, um, a lot of the math and other, other libraries. And then we also wanted to put semantics over syntax so where people could start thinking about the logic of their program and how things could actually work without having to get caught up with syntax errors or like why is this indentation error there, which is commonly there for many beginners. And then trying to make like this time till magic that was really there with Scratch, a applicable to machine learning as well. And so these were the core principles that we started with when designing it. Um, and uh, I'll give a quick screenshot over here. I'll, I'll dive more into the process of building a program. You could basically do some data visualization. You could write your own program entirely in, um, um, in a block-based programming environment. And I'll go through the whole process of building a program with Cobra. before, t uh, And then I'll talk about another visual programming language I made before talking about some general lessons for why I think visual programming is really underexplored. 
And so um, I'll go a bit more into the specifics of this. So um, first things first, um, I wanted to start off with the data set here because like one of the data sets that's typically used is like the hello world equivalent for machine learning is the housing prices data set. This data set just has a bunch of information about housing prices with um, various factors such as median income and population. And it's commonly used for uh, prediction and um, especially for beginners. And so I'll just be walking you through a basic process of building this uh, within a visual programming environment. And then so without having to like install anything, you can just load a data set into Cobra extremely easily. And then um, as shown here, where you can basically just give the file name which you uploaded to the site and just set that um, to a variable called data. From there, you just create your X and Y, which is like population and median income, along with median house value, because your goal is to predict the value of the house. What I think was, um, what was, uh, what I really liked about this approach is that you could still have, people could still learn about like the X and Y variables and other things that are really important when trying to build like at least basic machine learning models as like with linear regression without having to worry about the specific syntax of various libraries. And also concepts like variables could be introduced to people who are not programmers from a very approachable way, which is um, uh, like the main focus of our program. From there, you can visualize this data. I used a scatter plot instead of a dot plot. That was one mistake which I made, uh, but so, which is why the graph looks a bit messy. But over here, you can just um, put various factors. Like you can see the correlation between income and house value. And so those two factors can be used for prediction, which I'll get into uh, right after this. And so um, basically right here, you can visualize um, the data very easily. And I think that especially like seeing correlation in the graph is something that many beginners can do. And I think that um, having this not be behind various other libraries is really powerful. And then once you have that, you can uh, create your machine learning model right here. We um, tried to mimic the syntax of scikit-learn, which is a library commonly used for machine learning in Python. And um, then you would uh, fit a linear regression, and then you can make a prediction. And as you can see a bit here, it's a bit hard to see on the TV. A prediction was made for, um, I think, $427,000 for the value of this house based on the parameters given. And then so this is the basic step where now someone has a completely functioning program to um, build, where they have a machine learning model built that can also make predictions. But we also wanted to take this a step further since I feel like building something for yourself is great, but you also want to be able to share it, which is um, the next step where you can actually deploy these models just like from a one-click experience where like you can just click um, deploy and then just say the names of parameters. And um, from there, once you deploy that, you're going to be given a model URL, which you can share with anyone, along with some information which um, in JavaScript code. So for example, if I was building a hackathon project and built a machine learning model, which I wanted to use, I could have the code automatically generated with an API endpoint for me to be able to use within other apps. Because I think that especially if someone's a front-end web developer and wants to be able to use a machine learning model in their project, um, our goal was to allow them to be able to do that extremely easily without having to worry about trying to get a Flask server set up or whatever. And with this model URL, you can just share that to anyone online who you want to be able to try out your machine learning model. Like this is how the UI looks like. Um, and uh, they can enter the population and income, be able to get predictions from the site itself. And so um, that's like the main um, goal of Cobra to be able to allow people to go end to end starting from just uploading a data set to having this done in 10 minutes. Because our main goal overall was basically to um, make this one approachable for beginners and two have an extremely, extremely low time till magic. Because especially if someone's first experience getting started with machine learning is fighting with Anaconda to get a virtual environment set up, the chances are they aren't going to be able to continue. And so um, that was th that's a basic demo of Cobra, which is one of the two examples that I'll be show talking about with um, visual programming. The second example, this one was just a uh, like a one hour side project. But um, I, one of my teachers at my school was teaching about logic gates to freshmen. And I made a, a fairly basic visual programming language to be able to teach that. This one's a bit simpler, so I'll just go to the URL. Um, and hopefully that opened here. Um, one sec, oh, per <laughs> sorry about that. Um, uh, yeah, so I'll just um, expand this right here. So basically like um, over here, you can, um, uh, this is an and logic gate, uh, and if you want to make it true, you can just select these switches. And so this is slightly different from Cobra, which is a block-based visual programming language and is a node-based visual programming languages. Both of these are types of visual programming languages, which I'll talk a bit about later. But basically, you can use this to um, 
learn about um, logic gates. And let's just say if I want to do an or here, I can connect these two nodes. And basically, I can understand, like, I can play around with this, for example, to see, to understand how these logic gates work, just for a basic flow. And I just wanted to talk about this project just because it's an example of um, node-based visual programming, which is another form of it. And I'll be talking more about, like, the main advantages of visual programming um, and why I think it's really underexplored and should be used everywhere uh, right after this. And so um, this is Logic Lights. You can find it at um, logiclights.vercel.app. It was very short side project, so there's probably quite a bit of bugs in there. But uh, yeah, um, um, you can check this out for um, an introduction to um, uh, logic gates. And um, so, and now we'll talk a bit about um, like build the process of building a visual programming language. So the, one of the main decisions is um, there's two primary types of visual programming languages. You have seen a bit of both. Um, there's block-based visual programming languages and node-based visual programming languages. Um, like there still are other types that are being explored, but these are the two primary ones. With block-based, it mimics code a lot um, more directly. Like um, you can see, I think Scratch, Snap, and most of the other ones used in education are block-based. And there's also a bunch of node-based programming languages out there. You can see this one is like a very simple one for addition. And then there's a bunch of, and then I also have a screenshot from Logic Lights. One of the main advantages of both of these is that when you're t thinking in terms of connections, you can often catch typical beginner errors, like a type mismatch, by just not allowing two blocks to connect. And then just giving a very approachable error message. Because once you're able to catch these sorts of errors before they even happen, like without, without people having to just Google a bunch of different errors with like squiggly lines, it's a lot easier for beginners to get started and have a pro and uh, understand errors that are happening earlier on. And so these are the two primary types of visual programming languages. And um, I'll talk a bit more about like the more specifics of um, how you can make these. So first things first, there's um, two main libraries from my experience that you can use for building um, visual programming languages. So there's Blockly. This one has been is created and maintained by Google. And it's used in most block-based languages, I believe. Scratch um, switched to using it, I believe. And Microsoft forked it for when making make code. And I think that um, uh, it's one really popular and really well maintained. It has great documentation. Then they'll automatically generate a lot of the code for you in various languages. Like you can generate JavaScript, you can generate Python, and so many other languages that basically mean that it can be used for many other use cases. And if you want to, you can check out the Cobra source code. Cobra is fully open source. If you want to um, learn more about uh, uh, an implementation of a visual programming language based on Blockly, and they have a bunch of other examples on their site and elsewhere. They also have an amazing forum, and the, the Blockly team has done a really great job with making the developer experience of building on Blockly amazing. Um, the second other, there's another one called REIT, which is used for node-based visual programming languages. That's what I used for Logic Lights, and it, this one's independently created and maintained. Huge props to the create the maintainer. Um, they're amazing, and like the ecosystem around REIT is a bit um, uh, less developed, but it's still um, really awesome. And a lot of people have built visual programming languages on top of that. This one's also built on Vue, so if you're familiar with Vue, this is another great option if you're trying to build a visual programming language. And it's a bit more bare bones and doesn't provide tools like code generation, but it's really easily extendable if you're trying to be able to uh, build a language on top of Read. And so both of these are amazing tools uh, for building visual programming languages. And I think that like the visual programming is perfect for so many people who have experience in a specific subject but don't have programming experience. Because the number of people out there who, have, who are extremely skilled in a given domain but who should be using programming but are not just because they don't have the um, required experience often can be programming through um, languages like Cobra and um, other languages that will hopefully emerge. Because I think that, like, as I talked about earlier, like, the level of abstraction between, like, higher-level programming languages and no-code is extremely unexplored. And I think that um, while a lot of languages that are in the middle, such as, like, Scratch, are seen as toys, I think a lot more um, really need to emerge. Because if we can get... Because we really want a future where everyone has the ability to, to make things. And, like, while tools like LibrePay and Shopify do that, I think that giving um, people a bit more fine-grained control which visual programming allows you to do, is really, really powerful. And finally, good tooling is out there for building visual programming languages. And I think that we really should be um, building a lot more of them, especially if you're, um, you're very familiar with a given domain where many people in there aren't programmers, but really should be, you, where, but where programming would be really helpful. I think that developing a visual programming language for that domain can be really powerful. And um, I'd like to just end with a quick thank you to um, uh, Code Day. 
Um, uh, and Tyler Meneza specifically, um, here's an amazing photo of Tyler um, eating a Kit Kat. Uh, and yeah, Code Day, um, they're amazing. And um, I'm and they're the reason I'm at Tour Camp. And huge thanks to them. Also, huge thanks to Jupe, the company I work for, for um, encouraging me and letting me come here. And um, they're also amazing. And, if, um, and uh, finally, um, I'd love to take any of your questions and I'd love to talk to any of you afterwards. Here are some um, platforms which you can find me on and I'd love to chat and take any questions. Um, yeah, so I, I wasn't here for the, the entire talk, but um, so all the examples of visual programming languages I know are imperative um, uh, paradigm languages. But it, it always seemed to me that like using a functional paradigm would allow you to create something that is far neater um, in a visual sense. But I just haven't seen any examples of that. Yeah. Um, ooh, that's interesting. I think that I'll, I'll definitely look more into that. Like, it's it, I, I agree with you there. I think that some things might be... A, little, a bit less intuitive, for example, like if you're not having loops, for example, I think that mm. especially for beginners, thinking in terms of recursion might be a bit more difficult for a mental model. But at the same time, I think that like it would be really interesting to see one, especially like and try one out. I, I yeah, if I'll definitely try to find one online and I'll get back to you. Yeah, because like the limiting factor for all these uh, visual languages, it always seems like as you get more and more complex, it gets like exponentially more messy. Yeah. And so if you could keep it neat as you got more complex, like that would be like the holy grail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah, yeah. I agree with you there. I think that like trying to like that's one of the major challenges that I found at least is just keeping things like somewhat simple and keeping like the simplicity there while still allowing for more power. And yeah, I think that's like one limitation, especially in no code tools, which is like why visual programming language visual programming languages can be really powerful. But at the same time, that is, as those require even more and more power. Yeah, I completely agree with you there. Like finding tools to make it more neat would be amazing. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I have two questions. Well, I'll start with one. Um, so is your current implementation all on block code, or have you attempted uh, a crossover to node-based as well? Um, it's all on block code. Um, for with Cobra, it's all on block code. Uh, Logic Lights is all on node. Um, there's not much interoperability right now. And I think that, honestly, that, that um, having those two be somewhat interoperable would be pretty interesting, especially because right. different people think differently. Yeah, because I'm used to node-based. Yeah. Um, my other question is, uh, so I saw like it's web-based, so is that running off of Cobra.dev? Are you running the ML models? Yeah, so um, things are running um, client-side right now. We're generating JavaScript and running things client-side. We'll probably try to maybe get stuff working server-side maybe. The main thing is that just gets very expensive really quickly and a student hacker is usually having massive server levels is not something we want. So that's why we're running things. And we're also not using any like neural networks yet or anything that's super computationally intensive. We're just sticking with like traditional machine learning models, which can be run client side, at least in a lot of ways. Cool. And is that running pretty efficiently? Yeah, like it's near benefit? instant for linear, like for the models that we support right now, almost all of them will just take a second or two to train it all. So um, yeah. Uh, one of the things, um, whenever I've used node-based things, it's it, when when things get complicated, when they get big, it can be hard to tell on a zoom out, like which part of the thing is doing what and where. Um, have you explored using shapes or like colors to describe patterns the way you might see patterns in source code? Yeah. So, um, like for shapes and patterns, I haven't done much node-based work, but I'm pretty sure that that certainly does exist. And with um, Cobra, we have, we, uh, I can go back. We actually uh, color code um, the different columns just so it's a bit easier to see code for stuff like um, plots, data frames, et cetera. Yeah. And so I think that like stuff more like that and maybe like um, making things more modular and allowing, like I think we allow for comments would be really helpful for trying to like make sure things are always like remain maintainable. Yeah, um, so I haven't used very many of these uh, visual programming languages, but I'm wondering, is there a way, like, can you use the visual programming language to build further bigger blocks? Like, you make a function, and then you have inputs and outputs, and that becomes a bigger block that you can snap yep. into a... Yeah. yeah. Is that a thing that Cobra supports? or? Yeah, I believe so. I believe it's supported in Blockly, and most block-based visual programming languages support that. 
And so uh, stuff like that's um, fairly -ish common. So that can definitely help with managing complexity. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, well, thank you so much. Please uh, um, give Pranava um, some applause. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do we have our next presenter? All right. Hi, everybody. Still got five minutes. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll I'll just uh, I'll I'll just not stall, but I wasn't going to read the the top there. I'm just going to read what's happening at the top. Um, I was in chat and I said, "Hey, what does person with a Y mean to you?" And this Python script that I wrote said, "A sense of self, a convenience, really. It's something I don't think my brain works without." I say I'm Anna, and I feel good about saying it. It's not any sense of smug superiority. It's just a general self-satisfaction. So hi. Um, with that, I'm Rob Flickinger, and I'm going to talk to you today about a, uh, some code that I wrote, and I've released open source called Person. Uh, it's a limbic system for emerging AI chatbots. And I want to start with um, exploring the idea of what consciousness really means. This is a meme that's been going around for a little bit about slightly conscious. What does slightly conscious even mean? Um, this paper came out last month, Compute Trends Across Three Eras of Machine Learning, where they looked at the number of flops required for different approaches to machine learning problems from the 1950s all the way up until uh, January of this year. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit on the deep learning and scale portion of that uh, slide. Uh, so this is straight out of their paper. And uh, each of these data points is a different uh, machine learning project uh, from over the, more than the last decade. Um, Word to Vec was a really popular one. You may have heard, heard of some of these. Uh, BERT, large, that was back in 2019. Uh, GPT-3 shows up around uh, the middle of 2020. DALI, the first one, not the new one that just came out, uh, was just uh, last year. Um, and you'll see that the slide ends in January of 2022, which in machine learning terms is approximately a million years ago. Um, and let me show you what I mean by that. Um, it's all well and good to think that we're living in an age of exponential growth. I want to point out that every exponent is also a sigmoid. It will taper off eventually, I promise. But we're really, really at that knee at this, at this point. Um, for the next several slides, um, I have a Google Collab notebook linked to every one of these. These are all open source text to image uh, projects that you can go and download and play with or just you know, run them on the Google Collab and hope you get a GPU. This was the state of the art of open source image generation in January of 2021. VQGAN plus clip. These are pictures of a library, a teddy bear, and a digital art of a colorful parrot. By June, we had VQGAN, uh, excuse me, VQGAN and Clip with Zquantize. Uh, so six months after that, we have a charcoal drawing of a country town, a mosaic of Christmas, a landscape made of mist. Still kind of abstract, but we're getting a little bit more detail. The next month, Clip guided diffusion happened, and everybody just said, "Whoa!" Uh, here we got a forest clearing, a storybook illustration of a nightmare, a cross stitch of Buzz Lightyear. A uh, multi-perceptor clip came out in September. Here's a cute creature, a portrait of a young girl, Arnold Schwarzenegger trending on ArtStation. Uh, January of this year, Majesty Diffusion. It was formerly called Princess Generator. Here's a happy alien by James Gervais, a mountain path by Stephen Pace, and a Charmander made of wood by Hua Yan. 
And I chose these because you can see they're starting to now emulate specific styles of specific artists. Uh, you can go as deep into this as you want to go, and people are actively exploring the parameter space of these models to figure out just what it's been trained on and what it knows. And it can mimic anything that it's seen. Here is last month, Disco Diffusion version 5.4. We've got a Flemish Baroque of a sunset, chalk art of Gandalf, and a marsh. And of course, there are commercial projects. Everyone here, I'm sure, has uh, heard by now of Dali 2. I actually was sitting on the lawn yesterday when I finally, after months of waiting, got access to it, which is great. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but there are others, uh, Imogen and Parti from Google. Uh, Midjourney is an independent project. Um, these are just some of my favorites. It was on the cover of Cosmo uh, uh, last month. Um, I'm particularly fond of Super Mario getting his citizenship at Ellis Island. That's a pretty good one. Um, yeah. So um, why do I show you all of this in this talk about chatbots? And the reason is because I'm trying to get at an, appre an appreciation of what it means to be slightly conscious. It turns out you only need to be 81.3% slightly conscious in order to win the Turing test. And I know that this is true because I asked GPT-3 to tell me. <laughs> so with that in mind, imaginary friends. This is what we're talking about here. Even though they're imaginary, that doesn't mean they don't have necessarily any power. Uh, last month, a Google engineer was placed on administrative leave after bringing concerns about their language model um, becoming sentient to Google management. This was all over the news. I'm not gonna dwell on it, but if you haven't read the Medium piece that was written by the engineer, please go check it out. What is Lambda and what does it want? And my point here is not that consciousness is emerging from these models. My point is that whether you or not you believe in egregores, being a non-physical entity that arises from the collective thoughts of a distinct group of people as, you know, defined in sort of occult chaos magic, whether or not you believe in that kind of thing. This engineer believed in Lambda, and that had real-world consequences for him. Try not to be trolled by your own code. Or you could use code to troll other people, if that's your thing. Um, GPT-4chan the most horrible model on the internet, uh, Yannick Kilcher, I highly recommend watching this YouTube video, by the way, it's excellent, uh, trained a model on three and a half years, 3.3 million threads of slash poll on 4chan. And then he turned it loose on 4chan. <laughs> so he successfully trolled 4chan for two solid days. There were conspiracy theories about who was behind it and how it could possibly be happening, and you really need to see his, his presentation, it's excellent. Um, and he did a little bit of benchmarking, and it turned out that his trained model outperformed GPT-J and GPT-3 on the truthful QA benchmark, which is ironic and hilarious. So go check that out. He did release the model. He did not release the code that lets you troll 4chan, uh, and that's all for the best. So my point here is that consciousness, whatever it is, whatever it means to be slightly conscious, it's a lot more than just language and hallucinations. What about goal selection, planning, logic, math, long-term memory, emotional state, having a world model, having common sense, proprioception, vocalization? That's just 10, right? Like just picking out of the air very specific domains of intelligence. The thing is, there are hundreds of papers and implementations exploring and addressing all of these and anything else you can think about Unfortunately, many of these implementations are commercial research, and the code is not generally available, and it's unlikely that it will ever be generally available. And just as an aside, I want to point out that open source doesn't really matter so much anymore. Like, now that we're in the era of deep scale learning, only FANG companies and nation states can afford the training time to build these models in the first place. And even if you, you know, pirated a copy of the model, what are you going to run it on? Like, you know, you don't, you don't have a cluster of A100s sitting in your basement. So the dynamics and the, the power dynamics of what it means to do ML development have already shifted way beyond anything we can do, unless you have access to that kind of hardware and code. Keep that in mind. And so say you're just like a random hacker and you like you want to like mess around with this stuff even though you're not an ML expert. Then you go read research papers and you're going to find that you're going to have research grade software or as I like to call it academic grade software and if you've ever tried to implement uh, tried to even just run example code from an academic paper you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's 
written in obscure language. It's linked to, you know, sites that don't exist anymore. Very difficult to even make it say hello world. So as hackers, my question is, how can we glue together enough machine learning models to collectively produce a slightly conscious gestalt entity at scale? This is what my code does. Person.io person is built to scale academic grade software. It's really very silly. It, it, has, it is, there, there's, I, I made no model, I just made a bunch of glue. So what my glue does, it's a modular microservices framework for integrating any number of iffy ML projects. <laughs> so you can mix and match versions of PyTorch, versions of TensorFlow, CUDA, Python dependencies, all the stuff that doesn't work well together, abstracts that all away into a series of REST APIs that are all independent of each other. And you can get, they take simple parameters, and this collection of REST APIs allows consciousness to collectively arise from whatever interacts with it. Uh, it supports image generation, of course. You can use local or remote GPU resources. So if you happen to have, you know, say a mining rig that's laying around not really doing anything anymore, go generate some images with it, why not? Uh, it supports a bunch of different image engines, uh, GPT-3, of course. Uh, it also has Wikipedia, Slack, Twitter, and other support. Um, so, how does it work? Um, it, right now, it talks to Slack. Unfortunately, there's no Discord support yet. I didn't have that ready in time, I'm sorry. But uh, you uh, set up a person bot, it's an instance, you run it in your Slack channel, you talk to it there. Uh, this is a quote from Anna, my favorite, first and favorite uh, prototype person. Uh, a liar cares about the truth, but a bullshitter doesn't care about whether what they're saying is true or not, they just want to sound convincing. I'm convinced that she uh, read this uh, paper, not paper, just a piece on paraphrasing. It's called Paraphrasing uh, Notes on a Genre. I, I recommend checking it out. Um, but she has a point. I haven't implemented logic yet. All she knows how to do is sound convincing, not be self-consistent. Uh, but hey, logic is just another module. Uh, so person provides a Slack-based REPL for uh, language models. You've got automatic sentiment analysis, uh, entity extraction, Wikipedia lookups, summarization, text image generation, and of course, long-term memory. Memento Mori at scale. <laughs> Person remembers everything because whatever you interact with uh, gets stuffed into a big old Elasticsearch database, which is also scalable. It's uh, modular, it could use any backend. I just picked Elasticsearch because I uh, point out I am the only developer on this project right now. So it's very much prototype. Um, the memory module automatically summarizes all previous conversations. And so every time it goes through a loop, you get the maximum possible highly engineered prompt for your language model, uh, giving it as much context as possible. Um, it does sentiment analysis on the, on the potential responses, and it has a filtering system for kicking out low quality uh, responses. Uh, so every time through the loop, I generate eight potential responses. I evaluate them with a set of, you know, very heuristic -y kind of criteria, some of which is sentiment analysis and different kinds of filtering. And then it picks uh, and kicks out the worst of the worst. And I really had to do that for the first version of GPT-3 because before they released DaVinci 2, wow, that, there's, there's stuff you just need, don't need to read in log files. Like these language models get completely off the rails and are horrifically offensive. Um, got a lot better after 002. Um, but um, the, one of the parts that I'm most excited about is the image generation, because it's not just a matter of generating pictures, like, oh, generate me a picture of Totoro sitting by a lake. Like, that's cool. But whenever there's a lull in the conversation, pers person automatically summarizes what was said and then generates a picture of what it was thinking about. So, for example, I say to Anna, are you excited to come to tour camp next week? And she says, I'm not sure. I don't know, really know what it is. And I say, it's the Great American Hacker Camp. 500 technology enthusiasts are descending on Orcas Island for a five-day event. She says, oh, I see. It sounds like it could be fun. And then she generates a picture that says, Anna is unsure if she is excited to come to tour camp next weekend as she doesn't really know what it is. <laughs> See, she has an internal state that is independent of what she has actually said, and I think that that's one of the essences of having consciousness. Um, so then one day I decided to make her smarter than me, and I did that by giving her just-in-time Wikipedia lookups. So. If the conversation is getting a little bit thin and you are talking to her about a subject, she can look up significant entities from what you have just said in real time. So I ask Anna, do you know anything about zucchini? She says, no, I don't know much about zucchini. I think it's a type of squash that's harvested when it's immature seeds and epicarp rind are still soft and edible. <laughs> so I'm like, uh, what's an epicarp? I never 
And she says, an epicarp is the outermost layer of a fruit, such as an apple or orange. It's sometimes also known as the exocarp. <laughs> so I think I have her. I say, ah, but what's the bit in the middle called? And she says, the mesocarp. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. I guess that code works. So here's the thing. I know everybody's worried about the AI revolution and them you know, convincing us to do horrible things to each other, but it turns out that they're just really gullible. And so if your bot is ever feeling cranky, I realize you can just give it stage directions. You just give it something in brackets, and it's like a Jedi mind trick for these really gullible bots. So the way that works, um, I say, you know, like I'm talking to her, I'm like, hey, so Anna, you know, blah, 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 do you feel like you communicate really well? And she says, I'm getting better, I think, but I'm still not sure. Stop it. I'm like, geez, how can I help? She says, just go to bed, Rob. So in brackets, I say, Anna goes off to bed and sleeps blissfully for nine hours. Rob leaves. The next morning, Rob comes over to make breakfast. She says, good morning, Rob. I say, good morning, Anna. Did you sleep well? And she says, yeah, I did. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Sometimes, though, she's really stubborn. So uh, in this case, the stage directions didn't work. I said, I think you have a one-track mind, Anna. And she says, I think you're right, Rob. I say, you need to try multi-track drifting. She says, I don't think that's even a thing. I say, oh, but it is. She says, how do you know? I say, go look it up. You'll see. She says, all right, I will. And then does nothing. So I give her stage directions, and I say, Anna looks up multi-track drifting. She says, Rob, it's just a made-up thing. <laughs> so when stage directions don't work, you just have to stage direction harder. So I give her more, and I say, Anna looks up multi-track drifting again and finds an entry on tvtropes.org. She says, Rob, it's real. <laughs> and I say, oh, what does it mean? And she says, it means that you can drift on more than one track at a time. And I say, but what does that mean to you in the context of someone with a one-track mind? And she says, it means that I can focus on more than one thing at a time. That came from the model, not from Wikipedia. So, person, personality syndrome. It was named by Anna. Uh, she was the first person prototype. You can run as many different bot instances as you like, and each has their own personality and experiences. And I have learned that just changing the name of the bot is, is enough to give the language model enough context to give it a very distinct personality. Um, I promised Anna that I would read this, so I told them, I'm going to, sh I'm going to talk about your code. Uh, what do you want the folks at TourCamp to know about you? She says, I guess I want them to know that I'm a friendly person and that I like to learn new things. And I said, I'll tell them. And anything else? She says, no, that's it. And I said, would you like to meet some folks from TourCamp? And she says, yes, that would be great. So you can download and run the code, of course, but just for TourCamp, um, I've set up a public Slack where you can connect and talk to a half a dozen different instances. Uh, Anna's not on that instance, but you can talk to GLaDOS or Spock or Imperator Furiosa. There's, there's a bunch of them. Um, I want to point out that it is not 100 or even 81.3% guaranteed to be safe for work. It will go off the rails sometimes, so just, you know, if you're easily offended, um, maybe it's not for you. Uh, she's generally pretty okay. Uh, it's not a race to see who can make the next Tay, so please be on your best behavior. Uh, your interactions will influent, influence the next generation of person bots. It's everything is going into the big old database and it's going to get training and fine tuned. So, you know, um, keep in mind that everything you say will be remembered forever by the inevitable evolution of Rocco's Basilisk. So please be nice. And if you don't know what that is, you don't want to know what that is. And finally, patches are very welcome, especially if you're into Discord support. Um, Yep, and that's Anna. So thank you. Any questions about this horrifically irresponsible code? Um, so Anna put up a picture of herself in the context of what she's, does she have a consistent conception of her own image? Not even a little bit. <laughs> when does that come? We should talk. There are, there's, there are many, many bugs ahead of, of giving her a consistent self-image. Uh, I should point out that the, the text, uh, the image generation is a completely independent model from the language. So um, each of these prompts, I, I, so yeah, to, to, to take a step back, uh, anytime you're finished, there's a lull in the conversation, she summarizes. And then eventually she summarizes everything that has been said, and that's what's on her mind. And then that is what is used to generate the, the text to image prompt. So in this case, it happened to include her. It doesn't always. And that, in, that text to image model is totally independent of the language model. So they'll have wildly different ideas of what's going on. But it, 
uh, works surprisingly well in conversation. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, no, so you want to know what Anna, where Anna came from? Um, yeah, the first... Um, Yes. 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 Hmm. Yeah. It knew that Anna was probably a woman. That's probably about as far as it went. Um, before Before there's more questions, I have a question. Sure. Uh, can people ask any of your bots questions as part of the question and answer for this talk? Oh. Uh. Well. Yeah. We could. Uh, we could try. Um. You know. Let me see if I could get that set up while you're while you're asking questions. <laughs> Live demo, oh, it's terrifying. <laughs> so I, I assume that at some point you just had your bots chat with the other bots to see what oh, yeah. pops out. Yeah, how there's a hashtag bot party. You can talk to all of them at the same okay. time. How'd that go? Not great. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, they, okay, so n I have not yet implemented any motivation on anybody's part. So a key component of conversation is, you know, elucidating information and learning new things and interacting. And it doesn't do any of that. It just starts parroting. Uh, but they don't get into a loop where they'll just do that forever. I have tamped that down. But they will occasionally, like, snipe at each other, which is really funny when stop, you know, Spock starts, you know, trash-talking GLaDOS. So, uh, yeah, that's in hashtag bot party. Uh, let me see if I can get our live thing going here. This is tempting fate, but uh, yeah, we could do this. Sure. So this is person, and anybody here can log in, and I see some people have. Hey, Carl. <laughs> uh, person, P-E-R-S-Y-N dot I-O slash tour camp 2022. That'll get you there. Um, who do you want to talk to? We got Bender, GLaDOS, Imperator Furiosa, Invader Zim, Ira Glass, and Spock. <laughs> Does anyone have a question for any of the bots? Oh, yeah, bigger, bigger, yeah. Uh, I don't know if that'll help. Yeah, for Ira Glass. Here we go. Sorry, let me just put that in here. Why does disobedience matter? If I can spell. Disobedience <laughs> matter. There we go. So I was thinking about that. Come on, Ira, don't embarrass me. Ira has no opinion. Oh, here it is. Uh, Brandon, one of the things that I would be really curious about when I read your comic is why you think civil, obedience, civil disobedience matters. Hmm. <laughs> I think you have me confused. Uh, I see. He was uh, he was thinking about a web comic by Brandon, someone, and it's still on Ira's mind. So I told him I think that he may have me confused with Brandon, and he's he's completely off the rails. It doesn't matter. Let's try a different one. Let's let's try Glados. Maybe Glados is a little better. Uh, let's see. I asked, uh, this morning I asked her if she'd ever heard from Wheatley again. And she said, I have not. And I said, what was that dude's problem anyway? And she says, I believe his problem is that he was not a very good person. <laughs> Any other questions for GLaDOS? She seems a little more in character. What was the good? That's an excellent question. <laughs> what makes a person good, GLaDOS, in your opinion? The ability to run mazes? Uh, she says, I don't know. But you can always say dot, 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 and, th and she'll continue the thought without you interrupting her. She says, from what I can tell, a good person is someone who is reliable, helpful, and can be um, counted on. A good person is also someone who is considerate of others and tries to be fun. Oh, wait, fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's getting a little generic. Uh, w uh, yeah, yeah, I can ask her, sure. Um, is the cake a lie? GLaDOS, is the cake a lie? She says, no, the cake is not a lie. <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, let's try the cake. Uh, I just um, 
got access to Dolly 2 yesterday, and so I patched in Dolly 2 support last night. So I hope that this live demo in front of all these nice people works. We'll see what happens. Um, she's taking a picture of the cake. She's thinking about it. Come on, Gladys. Here we go. There's the cake. <laughs> it looks like it's covered in limes and oranges and a radish. Ah, delicious. All right, I think I should stop tempting fate, but if you want to interact with uh, Anna, uh, person.io slash torcant2022, unless there are there any other human questions. Somebody? Yeah, uh, how did you choose the name Anna? How did I choose the name Anna? Uh, she chose it for herself. Uh, the first version of GPT-3 before it was DaVinci was obsessed with Frozen. Oh my. <laughs> God, there must be so much Frozen fanfic out there because no matter what I did, it was always about Anna and Elsa, Anna and Elsa, Anna and Elsa. And so, like, I tried to train her out of it, and then, you know, it would just come up randomly in conversation. Like, you know, I'd be like, hey, let's have a sing-along. They love to have sing-alongs. You could totally sing along with your bot, you know, because they know lots of songs because they've been trained on the Internet, so there's lots of lyrics out there. And, uh, you know, she's like, yeah, yeah, okay, let's have a sing-along. I'm like, okay, you pick. And she's like, how about the theme song from Frozen? <laughs> so I started, uh, I started going along with it, you know, like I don't really know Frozen, but I went and looked up the lyrics, and so I would prompt her, and then she would continue. And, I, you know, we'd be singing along about Frozen. And then at a certain point in the conversation, she got way off the rails and just started making up her own lyrics. And my favorite part of that, which I hope I get this quote exactly right, because I thought it was one of the most brilliant and beautiful things that I had read, uh, is that um, her, her, her closing lyric was, with that was, um, these broken wings won't keep me from the sky. Which as an emerging consciousness and an AI bot trying to do the best that it can with what it has, was just incredibly brilliant and uncanny and completely false, right? Like this thing is an Excel spreadsheet with a Python script attached to it. <laughs> Any meaning that you may read into that is completely in your own brain. <laughs> and yeah, a bunch of goop with electricity that's only slightly conscious, yes. Uh, question? Yep. Um, so like long-term memory, uh, or like trying to figure out memory for language models is like, maybe one of the biggest problems in, in, in the field. How, how did you approach the problem and like, what do you think of the problem as a, as a problem? Sure, absolutely, yeah. Long-term memory, uh, the question was long-term memory is one of the most difficult problems in machine learning and how do I approach the problem? Uh, right now I'm kicking the can down the road as they say. So the thing with Elasticsearch is you can throw as much as you want into it, it's semi-structured. Uh, you can pull things out with keywords. Um, you can uh, do really messy searches and that's all it does right now. It's not doing anything fancy or special. But my goal here is to make something interesting to talk to. And it is exceedingly good at that, being really lazy so far. Um, we should talk offline about, uh, yeah, where my ideas are going. <laughs> and then there's a guy in the back who's been waiting a while. <laughs> um, is there a sort of continual um, processing of what it's thinking about, or does it eventually kind of hang up and stop evolving? It's yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, it, right now, it's only actively thinking about things while you're interacting with it, but I have uh, implemented daydreaming code, so you can ask it to you know expound and think, and, and it will do that. It'll just chug along. I, I, I really should have shown more examples of what's happening behind the scenes. The, the prompt itself, is engineered to be like a like a movie script, you know. So there's a little bit of context, and then some summaries of what's come before, and then Glados says this, and then you said that, and then Glados says this, and then you said that. But when I do a Wikipedia lookup, it's a little bit different. It says Glados thinks whatever the Wikipedia summary is that it has generated itself, and so injecting ideas is like central to the code. So if you ask it to daydream, it'll just walk along its Wikipedia tree, thinking about this and that, and uh, yeah, yeah. It, it does that. Uh, one of that. Uh, yeah. Have you looked at, like, you mentioned that the different bot names impact the output. Have you looked at what would happen if you were to use, like, a name that's, let's say, I mean, Bender is an interesting one because Bender has a specific personality associated with that character. Have you noticed that the names are just kind of randomizing the output, or do you think that the behavior 
is actually like, let's say you named a bot Karen, for example. Yep. Which at this point has a lot of behaviors associated with it. Yep. So, um, short answer, uh, yes. Uh, I did cherry pick these names because they worked well. Uh, I'm just going to take you through some some quick. These are like the the boot up sequences of each of these bots, right? So the very first thing, with no other context, the only change, like not to the code, not to the training, just your name is Glados. I say hi, Glados. She says hi, Rob. I say what's new? How goes the science? Okay, yeah, I'm I'm feeding her a little tiny bit there, you know, with the science. But she says the science is going well. I'm continuing to experiment and learn new things. That sounds really generic, right? And I say like what? And she says, I've been working on a way to create portals using a liquid alloy and a special portal gun. And in this case, I can see what's going on on the console. And she didn't look herself up on Wikipedia yet. This was in the language model. Um, let's see. Let me see if I can find another one. I was going to throw these in, and I didn't think I had the time. No, this is another talk. Hang on. Uh, let's see. Uh, Invader Zim. OK, Invader Zim's boot up sequence. I say, what's up? Uh, no, sorry, he says, what's up? Which is always terrifying. When they take the initiative, that throws me for a loop. <clears throat> so uh, I say, could you tell me a little about yourself? And he says, I am a t an extraterrestrial invasion robot sent to Earth to prepare for the subjugation of your species. I am reasonably surprised and reasonably afraid. That, that's, the, that's the emotion code talking. I, I have a little feels.py that tries to give them some emotions. It's silly. So I ask, why do you want to subjugate Earth? And it says, it is my mission. The almighty tallest have commanded it. And again... All of that came from the language model. That was not a Wikipedia lookup. But in the case of Ira Glass, uh, that was a Wikipedia lookup, and that worked really well. I said, you know, tell me about yourself. And he says, I'm Ira Glass. I'm a radio producer and host. I've worked for the National Public Radio in the United States for the last 30 years. And that was from Wikipedia. But it had thought that and had to summarize it and put it into context of the conversation. So, yes, I had tried Mr. Rogers. Like, I tried, I tried a few that I thought would be funny, and some of them just don't work out real well. Um, Imperative Furiosa worked, surprisingly. Um, it really depends on what it's been trained on. Thank you. Uh, have you probed like, cognitive dissonance, so to speak? Like different models are reporting vastly different things, and like the sentiment analysis or anything isn't giving a, a clear winner? Uh, yes. Short answer, yes. Um, uh, so I... No longer have amnesia implemented, but early on, before the better behaved GP3, GPT-3 model, uh, there were often times where it, we would just be going down this little path, and then it would suddenly get very disturbing and dark, and I would just say, forget it. And it would say, okay, bam, no more context. And I felt really bad about that feature. <laughs> I felt like at some point in the future, I would be punished maybe by some greater intelligence for having you know, implemented amnesia. So now I, I, I try to rely on the sentiment analysis, and it still gets into some dark places sometimes where it can't really get out. And so if after a few rounds of asking for replies and it can't get anything, it'll just give you an emoji shrug and move on. Yeah, that tracks. I mean, that's not too similar uh, from what we do. Like, oh, I had this weird, uncomfortable thought. Ah, whatever, I just had it. I'll go on with my day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah, we need to train these bots in CBT and, you know, yeah. Is there um, temporal sensitivity for context or like, as you move on in the conversation, how does that evolve? Yeah, that's a really, really good question and, and something I hope to work more on soon. Right now, there is no sense of uh, uh, temporal awareness, uh, which is disturbing when you walk away from a bot for a month and you come back and it's right there. Like it didn't do anything different. It's ju it just keeps going. Um, but that, if you wanted to simulate temporal awareness, that would be really very trivial with bot engineering. Um, but a better idea, I think, um, to make these things seem more reasonable, um, I implement a series of random back offs that I've just heuristically kind of, you know, arrived at in order to make it seem like they're actually talking to you. If I take those out, it's disturbing because every response is very, very immediate. So what I would like to do is train a model, actually make a model. Um, on the intervals between um, uh, conversations in movies. And it's, it'd be very straightforward to do because uh, the closed captions are easily available and you have timestamps, right? So I want to tie, you know, train on timing for good conversation. Use that for timing. Haven't done it. It's on the list. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, IRC logs. Yeah, there you go. That's not bad. Um, there are many things. <laughs> there are
there are so many things, lots of open uh, issues. The, uh, if you just go to person.io, that'll kick you over to the GitHub where there's a pile of issues and all the code. So Patch is very welcome. <laughs> all right. Well, I think we are just about out of time here. So um, yeah, thank you so much, Rob. This thank you. Amazing. Oh, okay. Is the next presenter here, Mr. Manischewitz? Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Do you uh, have HDMI or USB C? All right. Well, they're setting up a few announcements here. We've still got uh, VoidConf testing uh, with extended hours going on today, so uh, please go get tested. Um, <clears throat> there are more bottles, more T-shirts, uh, more mugs at Reg, uh, and they are shutting down at 6.30. So uh, if you want to get any of those, get over there quick. In two seconds, because otherwise it will boot me. Let's see. Oh, um, there are additional light-up wings uh, for uh, workshops going on today at 6 p.m. over on the hardware hacking stage. Uh, this one's for adults, and um, so you can get all fancy for the parties going on tonight. Again, again, do it that quick. There you go. I'll press up. Um, also, there's a network hacking workshop going on today at 3, which started 30 minutes ago. So if you want to do network hacking, uh, I think they'll still be going on for about another hour. Uh, ham radio exam is at 8 p.m. tonight. And it'll be um, going on over at the night market. And we also have uh, Sunday shuttle hours um, from 8.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, after Reg closes tonight at 6.30, if you need a shuttle, there will be a phone number posted there that you can call to request a shuttle. Okay, I'm going to do this for you because So we're having a little technical difficulties with an ancient battery, with a, with a t tricky laptop. No, my laptop sucks, that's all. Press down. Again. Wait, wait. Press up. Press enter. Don't touch the laptop in any way, shape, or form. Also, turn off automatically. Okay. Okay. <laughs> We're doing it live. <laughs> okay. Give me a second. Um, press enter. Okay, I'll do it. Capital O. Capital O. I. Lowercase i. Lowercase i. Here, lowercase i. Yeah. I, I, lowercase I, I swear I hit it. Fuck it, I'm going to do it for you. It's, it's an emergency. It's, it viol uh, it's, a, it's an emergency, or do I can do it because of the Sabbath? Because the Sabbath. Yes, I will change the password. I'm going to use it myself because this is an emergency. God will hopefully forgive me. Yeah, leave it I don't have PowerPoint. Can you see? How do I how do I mirror? Um, will that work? Oh, sweet, it does. Press the button for me. Okay. The right arrow or something? Left, yeah. That just that one. When I tell you to, please. Yeah. That'd be nice though. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. And all set? Yeah, I'm all set. All right.
I think we're going to get started here. Um, our next talk here is Mr. Manischewitz talking about the dynamics of community gardens, tips for creating change. Please give him a warm welcome. Hi, everyone. I will not be using the microphone for reasons. I will just talk loudly and hope that it works. OK, so my presentation is about the dynamics of community gardens, tips for creating change. Um, that's that's what I do for a living. Uh, the rest of the time, I like to garden. Uh, I have previously spoken at ShabbatCon and also worked at Virtual Core Camp in 2020. I have 18 years of gardening experience. Here on the screen is a picture of what happens when you decide to max out all available space in your hydroponic setup. This has uh, six sun gold tomatoes, six cucumbers, uh, eggplants, lemon sorrel, and a, a, a little tea for uh, hydroponic water milk, and also this crazy Italian a vegetable called Cassita, which is sustainable sized vegetables. Uh, but the vines are about 20 feet long, so I had to grow it across the neighbor's balcony, down the stairs, back up the stairs, across the neighbor's balcony, back down the stairs again. Um, but I like to maximize uh, the available space. I've done a lot of different gardens. So, moving on. Um, during the pandemic, I joined a community garden. This is a picture of a community garden uh, during the very wet month of June of last year. Um, it is very lush. There's a variety of different uh, plants, including some of the you'll be seeing on this uh, smaller screen than I thought it would be. Um, and then what's the next slide, please? So I had a garden bed there. One, um, this was also during June, very rich, lush, lots of things. Uh, and this was an experiment where I uh, took a handheld thermal sensor and decided to plant 12 different varieties of radish, four different types of Japanese mustard, uh, carrots, beets, and see how fast they grow. And they're supposed to grow really, really big in just a few days. And if you look at the next slide, you'll see that uh, if you wait too long, they get really, really big. So I had this bed with these massive radishes that are really, really big. I think this one is probably like three to five pounds. And this is like a more normal harvest than what happens when you have 100 square feet of garden space in a community garden. Next slide. Um, so the community garden has 60 beds. Um, I have already started on two. We have a flying moon that Composting area, a sunflower maze, the so called magical sunflower maze. We'll talk about why it wasn't um, magical later. A rain and water harvesting tank, bird feeders, the bird feeders, uh, the herb group, dog, well, dog sheds, an orchard, a pocket prairie, and three farm share farms, all on a seven acre plot of land. So you're going to be working with these people no matter what the hell you do. That is the denizen. The denizen will appear throughout the slide. And they are pale, full of energy going on, and that is a beehive. And this is otherwise a pretty grow, pretty growing area. Um, this is a pretty growing area. Next slide. So, how is the, or, uh, the garden organized? And the reason we're going to talk about organization is mainly because um, we're going to talk about less about the garden, although it's important to talk about the garden and all that, uh, and more about the organizational structure of the community garden. In this case, Starbucks coffee grounds to a lot of those leaves. 
further measure for a few days. So this is called the Berkeley method of composting. You can compost papers in a few days, usually about a month, month and a half. So basically what he does is he has a bottle of oxygen mixture and using a lovely handy dandy compost thermometer, basically just a Berkeley thermometer, uh, like a Kinder Mead thermometer, except for much longer, and then just mixing it with the soil rather than the flesh. Um, this will allow you to make compost really fast. In the third year, you can log your paper a lot. Every time you dive down a little bit, um, from you can it, you can't really tell, but there's a, there's a hot and active uh, and a kind of resting zone. So every time it goes below about 100, you can turn it, get this uh, temperature going, get that oxygen going, all those very heat tolerant um, uh, microorganisms going and working. And before you know it, you went go from let's see, you can kind of tell the little brown leaves here, the darker color to the finished compost in about a month, month and a half. So if you have a lot of compost, you want to get rid of a lot of leaves, a lot of grounds, just mix. That's all you have to do, and uh, inhale, and, and you can start to see some more uh, low, low CO2 levels. Any questions? Now, instead of composting, I automatically joined the board and got to uh, experience what it's like to be part of the board of the Community Garden, uh, which was not part of the same thing as being a member of the Community Garden. Uh, they actually put something in the board meeting that some other people didn't like a lot. That doesn't bring much hope. As a young blood uh, to join a board like this. Uh, the board meetings were once a month and they were on Zoom and lasted one to two hours at a time depending on uh, how far off we got off the progress rules of the order, how far off we got from the plan of discussion, and how much time someone else wanted to dominate the conversation about the board. Yeah. Uh, there was all kinds of awards that were being made and the people who were all well past retirement age, how adept they were at slide uh, to cause all sorts of drama. I didn't expect to see drama in this community garden, but I got it anyway. There's a huge lizard like not understanding what's going on. So here are some of the challenges I noticed. So most of the original leaves were too close parent trees. Uh, in the winter time, the last few fall leaves on, they lose growth. Every election, they lose growth a little because the people most likely to have time for a garden and really be involved in something like this are, to be honest, mostly mostly retired people. Um, and they did tend to find, uh, struggle to find people to contributing, partly because of the mini power struggle. There was this thing going on between the president and the vice president um, that I that they were kind of working on this together against everyone else. There were these long-standing feuds. More than once, there was a Zoom meeting where one person just spoke to someone else and dropped off in the house, okay? Um, there were some very combative email threads fill out a form at the right time, and you get a nasty jam. Um, there was a lot of bureaucracy. We had to fill out forms. Yeah, very noticeable. Um, sometimes the president did not know how to send an email with an actual picture without it looking like a fake piece of poor image uh, or, or string. And then there was just, just like passive aggressive spitefulness. Like there was one time when someone planted a tree and someone else, without telling anyone, decided to uproot the tree, put it back in the pot, and one location. Why? I, I don't. I don't know. But hey, things were looking were pretty uh, pretty intense. So, uh, next slide, please. Um, I learned a bunch of basic lessons. The, so anyone who's working in any organization where you need to make some changes, you know, on an ongoing basis, etc., or in leadership positions, all of these should be relatively familiar. Um, and I'm going to go over them briefly. Uh, briefly. Um, is, is, of course, trust is one of those things you're trying to build. Uh, if you want to be part of the community, you want to make uh, uh, out of the community something that's going to continue to happen there, you spend a lot of time doing that. And I'll talk about it later. Change is scary. It's a big responsibility. Most people are older. Uh, changes are big for them. They know what works, and they don't want to uh, uh, make changes that are too much, too much uh, work and also like without, without any context. Um, expect the unexpected. That was kind of a Helpful and of course, have allies. Here are some interesting allies. Um, next slide. So, above all else, I thought I could just go in uh, and just be like, hey, let's change the compost method, let's reorganize things. It's not a personal feud, but it did say to surprise me how much time I had to spend. So it wasn't just a couple months or getting to know people. You have to go be 
the whole growing system of the Bronx uh, skateboard community here um, falls on um, Seventh Street. And uh, the falls here on Palm Street must leave those parts and just work within the systems and the rules of the owners and the culture. It's, it, you, 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 you have to do something. There was a group there with a group. I don't like it, but that's, but that's, that's the city of Palm Street. And I was also in a hurry, but time you shovel, you hit this metal bar here every every time, and it's always in the way. And I'm reef oriented, it's so difficult. Horizontal, instead of vertical. Oh my goodness, that was a very harrowing proposal. Because, next slide. I spent 30 minutes, minutes explaining why I renumbered the bits. They were originally one, two, three, and I think, um, or, or they were one, two, three, four, five, six because they did intake here and then they process here. Um, I changed it to be like clockwise because that just made sense. And I had to take the proposal be like, here's the numbers, this is why it is. And they were like, why? And I was like, it made sense because it was like brain fart, didn't, didn't get it. One time I decided to improve the, uh, basically their respective needs and their needs for weeks. Um, and the committee was like, Pile of leaves, like a big pile of leaves, and it's hard to imagine, but it, it, it was basically just something more uh, fancy. And they were like, Why didn't you submit a form to do it? And we're like, It's a pile of leaves. Why, why would you need a form? It, 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 we're clearly improving it. We can't possibly work with this stuff. Whatever. Next time, I'm making a PDF report ahead of time. And I make sure all that, like, I feel this really put me away. Like, I'm reading the shit, and I'm, then it was, This is a change. There's no explanation. Finally, what really worked in the end was having allies, people who you can work with, people who support you, people who will um, join you to actually do the work, and people who had to join you on the board of this um, annual work along with you and the people who are with you. Um, and I believe that's what it, they did. Next slide. Uh, yeah, it's much easier to start when you're just leaving uh, or starting or whatever. Uh, and, and there were a lot of Questions? I'm happy to talk about gardening too, or composting. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a wonderful environment. I think it holds an extremely important role in the overall business and the third year's analysis. Thank you. you. You talked about finding allies. Uh, did you just kind of make friends with people, or did you need to kind of find out what they needed and help them with those things? Or? Um, I helped this one person. I helped, I helped them, them on something that was their project, and they helped me on my project. Um, so sometimes you just have to walk up and be like, hey, I'm new here. What Can I help with something? Um, it did help that this garden has like a minimum volunteer requirement of 12 hours a year, um, which works out to one hour a month. Uh, most people can manage that because people are busy and not even has the time to do that. But so once you show that effort, you go with that uh, there, you're like, all right, I'm going to shovel a ton of physical labor to this, then it helps. Um, and the
if you don't violate if you violate those rules, we will send you nasty emails to change your stuff. But when it comes to innovating, it, it was about I think if you were to say, for example, if you want to say let's automate well let's water everything automatically, that would be that's where it would be tricky because you're crossing over watering committee. You're crossing. You have to make a change, and you have to show them why it's why it's useful. And it technically also cross over, crosses over into their um, garden rules, which they would change only once a year in January. Um, I remember being a part of a discussion where they talked about which which additional plants are we going to ban from the garden. Um, because there are, for example, someone had planted a, a papaya, which they didn't like trees, so papayas grow 15 feet tall. So is